This Parsha really begins the story of the Jewish people. Until this point, we have the creation of the world, we have Noah, who is the father of all humanity, we have the destruction of that world, the rebuilding of a new world, but the tree keeps on narrowing. As the Ramchal writes, originally, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, had Adam HaRishon fulfilled his obligation. You know, the whole, the whole human race would have been the nation of God, so to speak. But what happens is that humanity shows that it's not worthy. Humanity gets excluded. This group gets excluded. This group gets excluded. And finally, everything boils down to this Avram Avinu. And of course, the process of limitation continues because Avram has Yitzchak and Yishmael, and Yishmael gets excluded, and Yitzchak has Yaakov and Esav, and Esav gets excluded. Right? Hashem is choosing, choosing, choosing. It's like if you ever look at that Google Earth, right? You start off with a picture of the Earth, and you go, you know, continent, country, city, street, house, you know, narrowing, 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 narrowing. And uh, what's interesting is this, you know, let me just digress for a moment here, and that is uh, uh, Nechama Leibowitz, who is a very, you know, religious woman and a very uh, esteemed uh, scholar and teacher of Chumash, although we don't quote her that much in yeshiva, but uh, again, she was a, a very religious woman. She once made a very interesting observation that we sometimes are so used to certain midrashim, they're so famous to us, they're so well known, that we literally think they're in the Chumash. We think they're in the Chumash when in fact they're not in the Chumash. And she gave an example, it's an example of Avram Avinu, before God appeared to him, when Avram Avinu was a young uh, boy, Avram Avinu was thrown into a fiery furnace. Remember the story? Avram Avinu's father, Terech, was an idol merchant, and he would sell idols, and uh, Avram was once put in charge of the store, and he destroyed the idols, and uh, when Terach said, what are you doing? You destroyed the merchandise. He said, no, the idols were fighting you know, with each other. And Terach says, oh, you know, what type of story is that? Idols can't do anything. And so Avram says, oh, you see, so what's going on? Anyway, what happened was, because of these types of activities, Avram got in trouble with the uh, king, which was Nimrod, and Avram was thrown into a fiery furnace. That is the meaning of the verse, I am the God that took you out of Ur Kastim. On one hand, Ur Kastim is a place, but it also means the furnace of the Chaldeans. And if you remember, Sarah's uh, father, Aharon, Avram's brother, uh, stood on the fence. He straddled the fence. And uh, he basically said, well, I'll see. If Avram gets saved, I'll go with Avram. If Avram dies, I'll go with Nimrod. And of course, Avram was saved, miraculously. Haran says, yeah, I believe in God too. And he gets thrown into the furnace and he dies because he wasn't willing to risk his life. He was hedging his bets. That's not emuna. Emuna is when you say, no matter what happens to me, I accept the will of God. Avram did not go into that fiery furnace thinking or knowing he would be saved. He was willing to die because he knew that belief in Hashem is more important than anything else. Okay, but be it as it may, the point that uh, Nechama Leibowitz made was that this is an example of a very, very powerful and important story that is not in the Chumash at all. It is not in the Chumash, right? There's a story. It's only a remez since it says, I am the God that took you out of Ur Kastim. We have a drasha, I am the God that saved you from the furnace of the custom. But it's certainly not Beferish. You could read the Chumash a million times. You would not know this story uh, from the Chumash itself. So Nechama Leibowitz recounts that as she was telling this story, there was an old army general, because she taught, she gave a lot of classes to the army, who was not religious, but he had learned Chumash as a, as a young child, and he said, what do you mean it's not in the Chumash? Of course it's in the Chumash. I remember this. So she gives him a Tanakh. Of course, he knows Ivrit, so he's able to, and she says, find it. So he's leaping through the Chumash backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. He can't find it. And he says, this is not the Chumash I had as a child. You know, give me the real Chumash, etc. <laughs> uh, but she made a point that indeed we mix up what the Medrash teaches us and what the Chumash teaches us. Now, that's not to say, God forbid, the Medrash is false. The Medrashim are also true, but they're part of the oral law and it's important to know, know the difference. So the question that one might raise is, indeed, if it is such an important story, Avram Zamuna, his willingness to risk his life for HaKadosh Baruch his faith, his determination, why does the Torah not record it? Moreover, the Parsha begins with Hashem telling Avram, go from your land, go from your father's house, go, and again, 
there are a lot of there are a lot of secondary questions here because the Chayra, if if you recall the end of Parshas Noach, Avram and Terach had already left Ur Kasdim to go to Eretz Yisrael, and uh, Terach died in Haran, which was not the place where Avram was born. So there, there, are, there are all sorts of issues. Avram is already not in his place of birth. The Ramban has a long arichus. Where exactly was Avram born? Uh, I don't want to focus on that question today, although there are, there are interesting questions. But Hashem chooses Avram. Hashem says, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And you will be a source of blessing to all the nations of the world. By the way, that happens to be true. Uh, any society that has persecuted or banished Jews. Now again, the Jews are not always the beneficiaries of the blessing, meaning God says, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. Now the Jews may have it tough no matter where they are. But it's true that after the Holocaust or whatever, after the Jews, after the Jews were expelled from Spain, the non-Jewish societies lose their bracha. Europe itself became empty, vacant. The culture, the science, it all vanished. Because God said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. So the question I, I want to ask is, it's not my question, but it's a question that Mephorshim asked, is why did Hashem choose Avram? Now, I can give you reasons, but those reasons are not in the Chumash. In other words, we could say, well, Avram you know, showed his emunah in Ur Kastim. Avram was makariv people, takas kanfi ashkina. But the point basically is this. If, I, if we ask ourselves the question, why, according to the written Torah, did God choose Avram to make a covenant with? There is actually no reason that is given. There is no reason that is given. Because all of the backstory, or custom and, and outreach and Avram, you know, taught about Hashem, all of the backstory that we know from the oral law actually does not appear in the written law. So it's kind of a double perspective here. Surely there are reasons why God chose Avraham. That's true. But those reasons are not stated. So insofar as what is stated, there is no reason for God to choose Avram. So the Maharal says this beautiful idea that this is an example of two different perspectives on reality. On one hand, certainly what Hashem does has a reason. Hashem chose Avram because he was righteous. Hashem chose Avram because he had faith. Hashem chose Avram because he was Moser Nefesh. He was willing to give his life. Hashem chose Avram because he also devoted his life with Sarah to making Hashem's, right, Esa Nefesh, the souls that he made in Haran. Chazal have a drasha. Again, it's not Beferish in the simple meaning that Avram brought so many thousands of people under the wings of the Shekhinah. Sarah did it with the women. Avram did it with the men. So certainly there are reasons but the Torah doesn't give you the reasons. Why is that so? So the Maral says the following. Perkei Avos, there's a, mimer, a famous Maimer Chazal, you may have uh, learned this or heard it, that says, any love, ahava shi tuluya bedavor, any love that depends on something. If I love you because of, if the because vanishes, the love is going to vanish. But an ava that is not connected to a particular factor. That's called ava sha'ena toluya bedavor. Yeah, well the phrase is ahava shehi toluya bedavor. That means love that is dependent on a thing, a factor. So if something is ahava shehi Toluya bidavar. So Pirkeyavo says, this is Pirkeyavos, Batla Davar. If the thing is nullified, Batla Ahava. The love is nullified. Mm -hmm. That's the first part of the statement. The second part of the statement just reverses it. Ahava Sha'ina Toluya Bidavar. Love that is not dependent on a thing, right? So even if it's batla davar, lo batla ahava. So the maral says the following. If the Torah would have said 
God chose Avraham because he's righteous, because he's good, because he has emunah. That would have made it ahava shehi tuluya b'davar. So what happens if the Jewish people, as we sometimes are, we've lost, lost our faith, we stop keeping the mitzvahs, we get assimilated. Now God punishes us, of course, that's true. But you might draw the conclusion that Hashem will abrogate his covenant, no longer care for us, no longer have a relationship with us. But that's not Emes. Hashem chose Avraham. But the love and the covenant that Hashem had made with Avraham is an absolute covenant. It is a covenant that will never be abrogated, a covenant that will never be bottled. Yes, it doesn't mean we get a free ride. There is din v'cheshbon, there is accountability, there is punishment, but even the punishment comes out of God's love and God's concern. The fact that Jews are punished more severely than other nations is just as a parent will dis. I see some kid doing something, I'm not going to, you know, discipline the kid. I might get arrested <laughs> for child abuse or, 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 whatever, or whatever it is. But when it's my son that I care about, I'm going to get involved. I, I, don't, I don't mean, I'm not endorsing hitting. That's, a, that's another schmooze. But I'm going to get involved in terms of discipline and the like. Discipline is not a sign of disdain. This is, discipline is a sign of love and care and concern. So yeah, Jews get punished very, very severely. But the point is, God's love for us is always here. So the morale's point, it's a beautiful, beautiful point, that Hashem didn't want to give reasons. Yes, certainly there are reasons. But Hashem didn't want to give reasons for choosing Avram, because Hashem wanted to establish the idea that his relationship with Am Yisrael is ahava she'ena toluya b'davar. It does not depend, meaning it's not like he loves us because we're righteous. He loves us, and he loves us, and he loves us. And then there'll be consequences. There'll be, you know, obviously, because of that relationship, there'll be schar v'yonesh, there'll be the tochecha, all of those different things. Yeah. So are you saying that he, that Hashem loves someone exactly the same, even if however many times they get, however many times they pray, however many times they put them to fill in, the love is still the same between him and any other group? Well, well uh, that, that's a hard question, because essentially, if, if, if you were to say it exactly as you're saying it, uh, you would basically be saying, Hashem loves the Russia as much as Hashem <laughs> loves the Tzaddik. Uh, that would be, I think, a difficult position to sustain. Uh, certainly, I would think Hashem loves the Tzaddik more, but you're dealing with levels of infinity here, which technically cannot be quantified, meaning to say, God's love for even the worst Jew, whoever the worst Jew is, you know, I mean, we might be the worst Jew, whatever it is, God's love for the worst Jew is so infinitely great and infinitely deep that we can't even measure it. Now, that doesn't mean to say the love for the righteous isn't even greater. Although for the mathematicians in the room, I, I know that I, I made a logical fallacy of saying something can be greater than infinity. I don't know, I, I don't know, I don't know how to work that out, but HaKadosh Baruch, Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can figure out how to work it out. So, so I, I wouldn't want to suggest equivalence because I think, I think it's very, very clear that Hashem has a greater love for the righteous, and then, of course, even a greater love for the Balshuva. Right? Remember, the Balshuva is more beloved than even the righteous. But still, we need to understand that there is no Jew that Hashem rejects. There is no Jew that Hashem hates. There is no Jew that Hashem says, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. And uh, that's what the Maral says. We want to make it ahava she'ena toluya b'davor. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, a person needs to know this. By the way, just as a, uh, another digression, uh, I don't want to get in trouble there, but many of you are, are undoubtedly familiar with the, uh, the very famous classic, classic work, which is, at least in Chabad Hasidus, is the, uh, their, their primary book, and that's the Sefer Atanya. The Sefer Tanya, uh, Tanya is just the first, Tanya means we learned in a because that's just the first word of the book. But the, the, the title of Tanya is not Tanya, actually. The, the title of, uh, is either... The whole book is called Likute Amorim, which means an anthology of sayings. But the main part of the Tanya is called Sefer Shel Benonim, the book of the middle of the rotors. And why, 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 why is it called the book of the middle of the rotors? This is what the Balatanya says. You know, we know that Chazal divide 
people, but we just, we're just coming off Rosh Hashanah, so we, this was discussed on Rosh Hashanah, certainly. Uh, the, the world, people are divided into three groups. There are tzaddikim, the righteous people. There are rishoyim, there are evil people. And there are benonim, that are middle-of-the-road people. Now, the Rambam gives uh, a very, very precise definition. The Rambam says, tzaddikim is when you have more mitzvos than averos. Although even the Rambam explains that it's not a numerical calculation. Hashem has a qualitative evaluation. So one mitzvah might equal a million of errors, etc. But however Hashem does it, and we don't know, the Rambam says, but ultimately, if you have one more mitzvah than Avera, you're called tzaddik. 51% to 49, tzaddik. If you're 51% 49 on the other side, Russia, even though you have 49%. And benonim is 50-50. Now the question is, you know, 50-50, this is a very, very difficult concept to understand because 50-50, because I mean, uh, how often are you going to be 50-50? I mean, if at 12 noon, you know, 12.30, I was 50-50, so if I said a good word of Torah, so I'm now 51. And if I yelled at somebody, um, I mean, that's the other <laughs> meaning. It's very difficult to imagine. In other words, if you're defining Tzaddik Russia Benoni, that continuity. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying if you're fighting it that way, then, you know, you change every second. All right, so I'm not going to answer the Rambam, but the Balatanya has a radically different definition of Tzaddik, Russia, and Benoni. And this is very fascinating. He says, a Benoni doesn't mean 50-50. He says a person can be a Benoni even if he's a Russia, based on he has many more sins than mitzvahs. But a benoni means he's in the world of struggle. He's still struggling with his Yetzir Tov. Now, the tzaddik has kind of achieved victory, and the Russia is no longer in the game. But the person who is still struggling and trying to be a good person, even if, this is the Balatan Yitzchidosh, even if he fails more than he succeeds, is what we mean by a benoni. A benoni, he's trying, he's trying. And I have to say that, you know, if you read the Hakdama of Shneur Zalman's Hakdama to the Tanya, uh, he actually wrote this to give chizuk to his chassidim. Originally, he, he was like, uh, he was a Rebbe therapist. In other words, people would come to him. They felt that they had failed so much. They had made so many mistakes. They have so many averas. And they felt that they were just rishayim that Hashem rejected. And he developed the idea that when you're in the world of struggle, you're in the world of the benoni. And therefore, the Benyoni can always become a tzaddik, as it were. And this is a very comforting idea, that a person should not look at himself as a Russia in that sense. A person should understand that if I'm trying to become a better person, even if sometimes it's one step forward and two steps backwards, but as long as you're on that road, uh, you are in the world of the Benyoni, and the Benyoni, once again, has these, the Efsharis of Shuba and, 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 and the like. Okay. So this is the morale's point that Hashem's love for the Jewish people is Ahava She'ena Teluya B'davar. Now, at the end of the parsha, so Avram, Avram is commanded to go to the land of Canaan, the land that I will show you. He's not even told where it is. When he is 75 years old. Now, it's interesting, again, chronological issues are actually very interesting in these parshios because it seems from the Chumash that Avram Avinu came to the land of Canaan when he was 75 years old. And yet we can prove from an earlier, actually from a, from a later part of the Parsha, that Avram was al already in Eretz Yisrael from the age of 70. Because you'll remember that in the Parsha, when Avram asks Hashem, what type of guarantee do I have that my children will merit inheriting the land? So we have the very famous and ominous covenant of the parts. Did you, did you read that part where the different animals are cut up? And Avram walks between them, and the divine presence goes between them. And this is called the bris, the covenant between the parts. And that is when Hashem tells him, you shall know that your children will be enslaved, be strangers and be enslaved in a land that is not theirs. And they will serve, they will be servants and be afflicted 400 years. And the nation that enslaves them, I will judge. And then they will leave with great wealth. Do right? you remember though, those verses? Uh, it's in the Chumash, and we also say it in the Haggadah, which takes it from the Chumash. 
not like some people say, hey, the Chumash took it from the Haggadah. Not the Haggadah, the Haggadah is later, but it's in the, it's in the Chumash. Now, here's the thing. The Mephorshim, Chazal, Chazal point out, well, wait a second. There's a Gezerah, they're going to be in servitude 400 years, but wait a second, we know they were only in Egypt 210 years. We can figure that out. So how do you get 400 years? So Rashi explains, again, from, from Chazal, that we're not counting the 400 years from the time they arrived in Egypt, but rather the decree was that there would be servitude and, and persecution to Avram's children, and that even includes the time they were in Eretz Israel. So we are counting the 400 years from the birth of Yitzchak, that from the birth of your child Yitzchak till Yitzhiat Mitzrayim is 400 years. Now, let's take it one step further. If uh, it is 400 years from the birth of Yitzchak to Yitzhiat Mitzrayim, how old was Avraham when he was told this? Because here is the thing. Avraham was 100 years old when Yitzchak was born. Okay? Now, from the birth of Yitzchak to the Exodus is 400 years. We know from Parshas Bo that from the birth of Yitzchak to the... To, I'm sorry, from, from the Brisbane Apsarim to the, birth, to the Exodus is 430 years. So the Brisbane Apsarim was 30 years before the birth of Yitzchak. If Avram was 100 when Yitzchak was born, and the Brisbane Absarim was 30 years earlier, Avram must have been 70. How could Avram be 70 if Lech Lecha says he came to Eretz Yisrael when he was 75? And the answer is, the Rishayim tell us, that Lech Lecha is Avram's second trip. He had actually come to Eretz Yisrael on his own five years earlier. Then he left, came back. Right? So, so the chronology is very, very interesting. Uh, but here is the thing. We have this Brisbane Absarim when Avram is 70 years old. Uh, Yitzchak is, of course, you know, Yishmael is born when Avram is 86, and when, uh, when Avram is 100, Sarah, Sarai, Sarah is 90. That is when Yitzchak is born. Uh, but at the end of Parshas Lech Lecha, when Avram is 99, right before the birth of Yitzchak, he is given the commandment of bris mila. He is given the commandment of a tangible covenant in the flesh that he and his children make. And of course, Avram had his bris at 99, and Yishmael had his bris at 13. And when Yitzchak was born, Yitzchak had his bris. Yitzchak was the first one that got his bris at eight days old and the like. And you see very, very clearly that Yitzchak could not be born the nation of God could not really be propagated until there was the covenant of circumcision. And you see another thing as well, that the name change of Avram and Sarah, right? His original name was Avram. Her original name was Sarai. And the hay was added to Avraham. And Sarai became Sarah. All of that is connected to the commandment of bris milah. So I want to speak a little bit about why bris milah was fundamentally so important, and indeed, why is there a shinoi Hashem only in connection with bris milah? So let's first look at the name change. Avram, which was his original name, means exalted father. The hay that was added is connected to the notion that Avram will not only be an Av for Aram, also Aram, Aram is also connected to Aram, meaning Syria, that part where he came from, Haran, but he will be Hamon Goyim, he will be the spiritual father of a multitude of nations. Similarly, Sarai, the Midrashim actually say, Hashem took the Yud of Sarai and divided it into two Hays. So one Hay was left with her, one Hay went to him. So essentially, it was the Yud that was divided into, into two. So here, the Maral says a very fascinating idea about the Shinoi Hashem. He points out that the Gemara in Menachos tells us, and we don't fully understand what these ideas mean, that this world was created with the spiritual letter He, the power of the, of the letter He, and the world to come was created with the power of the letter Yud. 
Right? There's a verse that we say every day in davening. Ki baka Hashem ka is yod hey, ka Hashem tzor olamim. God created worlds with the name ka. So the Gemara in Menachah says, the yud, worlds means olam hazeh and olam haba. Yud is olam haba, hey is olam hazeh. Again, what it means to create by the spiritual letters of the Aleph Beis is really beyond us, but suffice it to say that the letters of the Aleph Beis themselves are the DNA of the universe. DNA itself, by the way, is represented by letters. Different letter combinations, as it were, bring the spiritual creation into place. This is a Gemara in Menachas. Maral explains, why is Yud the letter of Olam Haba and He the letter of Olam Hazah? So he says, Yud is the least physical of any letter. Yud is a point. So Yud represents spirituality that is not embodied in matter. So that's Olam Haba, the world of Ruchnius, the world of spirituality. What is a He? A He is a composite of two letters, if you could visualize it. It's a Dalit. And the little left leg of the hay, he calls a yud. I, I would have thought it's a vav, but he calls it a yud. That would go with that. Now, dalid, the number four, represents materialism. Because there are four dimensions of matter. There's length, width, height, and time. Because matter exists within the framework of time. The notion of space-time was not invented by Albert Einstein. <laughs> but indeed, it was known by Chazal, and of course, not. I don't even have to say it was only because it was even known. I mean, Greek philosophers, Lahavdil, spoke about time as an aspect of matter as well. I mean, technically, without matter, there really is no time. I mean, time exists as a component of a material universe. That is why time itself is a creation. Again, we don't really understand what that means, but God created time just as God created everything else. So Dalit represents pure materialism. Yud represents spirituality. So now you understand. What is Olam Hazah? The world of materialism in which we must infuse with spirituality. So the Yud is the pure Ruchnius of Olam Haba. The He is the infusion of Kedusha into the Gashmis. Now, it's no accident that the numerical equivalent, the gematria of He, is only half of that of Yud. Meaning, spirituality will certainly get diluted when it comes in confrontation with the material. Right? In other words, you could be a more spiritual person if you'd be a Buddhist monk and you'd retire to nirvana and sit on top of a telephone pole and not be involved in the world. But that's not the Ratzon Hashem. Remember when the angels told, Mo, to, uh, told Hashem, why give the Torah to people? Leave the Torah in Shemayim. But the ultimate answer was no. The Torah is designed to teach us how to sanctify this world. So it is true. In a way, the neshama coming down to earth is a, is a bit of a tragedy for the neshama. The neshama doesn't want to come to earth. The neshama wants to be with Hashem. The neshama wants ruchnius. The neshama wants spirituality. To go to a world of temptation, you may have heard the very beautiful song they have, uh, Little Neshama, or something. It's, it's a whole parable about uh, a Neshama that is begging Hashem not to come to earth. But Hashem says, it's your mission. And then, of course, after 120 years, when it's time, then you don't want to leave because we've become too habituated uh, to, this, uh, to this earth. So in a way, life is kind of a tragic compromise. That's why Chazal even say, no, Achli Adam Shalom Nivra. It would have been easier not to be created, just to enjoy the Zif Hashchina. But God wants us to struggle. God wants us to earn our reward. God wants us to have trials so that we become stronger and better and greater, that we don't get the bread of embarrassment, as, as the Ramchal uh, says from, from the Arizal. Right? So that's why it's a hey. It's not as intense as the spirituality of the Yud. But the tachlis habriya is we should be machnis the yud into the dalit. Right? You understand the idea of the yud and the hay? Now, to digress for a moment, we're going we're to segue back to bris mila. This is why I'm sure you've heard those, those, uh, well, those of you that are married uh, heard this at your own shavu brachas. Those of you who are not married either heard it at other people's shavu brachas and you will hear it certainly at yours. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh, but the thing is, 
there's a very famous, one of the most famous Gemaras, because it's said at every Sheva Brachas, of everybody, is that Ish and Isha have two common letters, Aleph and Shin, which is fire, but they also have God's name. The man has a Yud, and the woman has a hay. So the Gemara in Yavama says the very beautiful idea. When Hashem is with them in their lives, men are doing what men do, and women do what women do. Everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Take Hashem out of their marriage, they become an all-consuming, selfish fire in which your egotism and your selfishness is going to burn you up and burn them up and destroy your house, destroy your home. Beautiful Gemara. But what the Gemara doesn't explain is, okay, yud and hay, but why does the man get the yud and the woman get the hay? <laughs> why is God's name divvied up that way? But the Maral explains. We can understand this very beautifully. Because here is the thing. Although it is true that for both men and women, our job is to sanctify the material. Men, frankly, have a harder time uh, because men tend to get corrupted by their encounters with the outside environment. There is testosterone, there is competition, there is arrogance, there's gaiva, there's ego. And therefore, just like, God forbid, a person with emphysema may need an oxygen tank, Men need environments of pure oxygen. We have to go to yeshivas. We have to go to kololim. We have to get away from the world a little bit because the world is going to drag us down. So a man's avayda is closer to the pure yud, not because he's greater, but because he's less able to deal with the externalities of an environment. A woman, again, I know we're generalizing, but a woman, bateva, because she's involved in family and children, in the details of running a house, understands how to bring Kedusha into the everyday. So the woman is more mesugelet to the Bechina of hay, and the man has a greater connection to the idea of Yud. Right? You understand this as it fits? Okay. So now, going back to Bris Mila. Bris Mila has many, many ideas, and again, uh, we could talk much more about this, but at least one of the ideas is stated by the Sefer Achinuch himself. The Sefer Achinuch points out that bris mila is done precisely on the anatomical part of the human being that on some level is most animalistic and least susceptible to voluntary control. You know, the sexual organ and, 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 and the like. And we would associate that with maybe the animalistic part of our being. But what Bris Mila teaches us is that in Judaism, we do not recognize a dichotomy. We don't simply say, oh, there's the spiritual part of you and there's the animal part of you. We recognize through the letter He that even the part that is animalistic on one level can be elevated and consecrated and dedicated. Consider, for example, the difference between Judaism and Catholicism. There are many differences, of course, but by putting aside who's God and everything else, which is obviously a major, but look in terms of how they view the body, how they view the flesh. In the Catholic tradition, the idea would be that uh, if you want to be a holy person, you have to be celibate. You can't, get, you can't get married. In other words, marriage is tolerated for lesser people, people who are not on the madrega, to be truly holy. So they get married. There's actually a passage in the Christian Bible that says, better to marry than to go to hell. Meaning, if you're going <laughs> to, right, we'll let you get married. Be the so to speak. Because once again, that posits the body as an evil thing. So... If you can't avoid it, you know, okay, but the average, you got to eat, you got to do all these things. <coughs> Judaism is for care. The very first mitzvah is, of course, be fruitful and multiply. According to the Rambam, marriage itself is a mitzvah, even if one doesn't have children, meaning apart from pru or vu, marriage itself is a mitzvah. We do have one case of celibacy, which is Moshe Rabbeinu, and again, that's a good kasha, but, but all I can tell you is, without answering Moshe Rabbeinu's situation, huh? it is absolutely, I mean, he was married, but, but he was separated from his wife. But he had kids. He did have children, he did have children, but, but, but for a lot of his life, he was separated oh. after that point. Yeah, no, he did have kids, yeah, you're correct. But all I can tell you is that in spite of the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest uh, person uh, we ever had, 
we are specifically told we are not allowed to imitate that particular <laughs> practice. He is in a category of one, not to be emulated, not to be imitated, right, etc. And the reason is very simple. Because we do not regard physicality and materialism as evil. We regard it in some ways as neutral. And everything depends on what you do with it. So that's what Brismila teaches. So now you understand why, as it were, both Avraham and Sarah get a hay after Brismila. Because if the message of hay is the ability to spiritualize the physical, that was the gift that Brismila uh, was machadish. It taught us that even within the most physical parts of ourselves. Now, this is a very important idea. Uh, you know, uh, that's why mitzvahs, and there are mitzvahs of eating and mitzvahs of procreation and mitzvahs of marital uh, intimacy. And uh, the Rambam basically says, every single thing we do, if we do it to serve Hashem, becomes part of Avodah Hashem, even neutral things. Uh, for example, you play, you know, if you play basketball during lunch, uh, if your kavana is, I'm going to play because I want to be in better health, to be able to daven better, to be able to learn better. Then the Rambam writes, it is not just your davening and your learning that's considered to be serving Hashem, but the basketball playing and the running and the bicycling is part of Avodah Hashem because you're doing it to serve Hashem in a better place. And the Rambam writes, and based on that, there is room in life for recreation, again, permissible <laughs> modes. Are, there, there is room in life for everything. Because if it's done for the purpose of giving me the energy and the strength to do mitzvahs, it becomes a good and noble thing. That is why, in many ways, the Chavos HaVavos writes, there is no such thing as something that is religiously neutral. Everything you do either brings you closer to Hashem or it brings you further from Hashem. And if it brings you closer to Hashem, it's a good thing to do. If it brings you further from Hashem, it's a bad thing to do. And this goes beyond mitzvah and avera. Mitzvah and avera is, uh, is uh, certainly, those are lines we can't cross, mitzvah and avera. But in the whole realm of life that we might call neutrality, where do I go on vacation? What type of car do I buy? You know, where do I live? These might be neutral decisions. But depending on why you're making them, they bring you closer, bring you further. And you always have to ask yourself. And um, this is encapsulated well. There's a very, actually a very well-known book, not written by a Jew, and it's not a Jewish book, but the title is a good title. And uh, this is called The Purpose-Driven Life. Life should be driven by a purpose. And of course, that is the first line in the Mesila Shisharim, in the Hakdama, that the Mesila Shisharim says, the Ramchal writes, that the, the source and the root of all wisdom is that a person knows why he is in this world. And once you know why you're in this world, you can then evaluate every activity. Is it bringing me closer to my purpose? No. But I guess the point I want to dispel, though, is sometimes people read lines like that and they think that this means there have to be a, a humorless, somber, serious, you know, in which, you know, I, I can't say hello to you because it is distracting me from my purpose. Th that's, not, that's not what the Ramchal means and that's not what the Torah means. Uh, you can say hello to people, you can schmooze with people, you can joke with people, uh, you can play basketball, you can ride your bicycle, you can go to a kosher art museum, again, kosher, the one has to evaluate all of these things. But, but what the Ramchal is saying is every decision should be based on in the long run is this going to help me in my relationship with God. And if it will, then it's a good decision. And if it won't, then it's a bad decision. So, Mr. Hashem, hope that all of us will be zochah to make the right decisions and uh, become closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And, and in that way, all of us can be instruments to bring the Geulah Shleimah. Amen. Amen. Amen.